So good evening. I'm Lonnie Stonich, the executive director of FAN, a nonprofit that presents, pro, presents programming exploring human development across the lifespan. I'm honored to welcome you to tonight's conversation between Dr. Mary Pfeiffer and Dr. Nancy Burgoyne. Thanks for joining us tonight. FAN's YouTube channel has an archive of nearly 300 videos of past events, so be sure to subscribe to the channel to get updates when new recordings are posted. And now for some introductions. Dr. Mary Pfeiffer graduated in cultural anthropology from the University of California at Berkeley in 1969 and received her PhD from the University of Nebraska in clinical psychology in 1977. She was a Rockefeller scholar in residence at Bellagio and has received two American Psychological Association presidential citations, one of which she returned to protest psychologists' involvement in enhanced interrogation techniques at Guantanamo and other Black sites. Dr. Pfeiffer is the author of 11 books, including four New York Times bestsellers, including Reviving Ophelia and Women Rowing North, Navigating Life's Currents and Flourishing as We Age. Her latest book is A Life in Light, Meditations on Impermanence. I'll just give you one second. There you go. You can come on in, Mary. Very good. And now, Dr. Nancy Burgoyne is a clinical psychologist and proudly serves as the chief clinical officer at the Family Institute at Northwestern University, a nonprofit behavioral health organization affiliated with Northwestern. In addition to educating over 800 graduate students and conducting clinically relevant research, the Family Institute provides scientifically informed mental health care to more than 7,000 individuals, couples, and families annually. The Family Institute's Betty D. Harris Clinic provides free therapy to under-resourced couples and families. And now let me invite Nancy on in. Okay, Nancy, come on in. Great. And now let's welcome Dr. Mary Pfeiffer and Dr. Nancy Burgoyne. Thank you, Lonnie. Thank you so much. Hello, Mary. Hello. I'm so, I'm so genuinely delighted. We had a chance to chat a little bit before the start of the webinar, which was such a pleasure. And um, I got a chance to tell you how profoundly impactful your, your work has been all the way back to hunger pains, I think, which was in 1997 and all the way through my career and my personal life. So really such a pleasure. Thank you so much. Um, I do wanna focus on this book. Um, you've published many and we could go a lot of places, but this is a, this is a beautiful memoir of sorts and um, told in essays and stories. And it's really a, a beautiful read. Um, and you had an experience, a really formative experience um, that you tell the story of in the book that I'd like to start with it, if I may. The summer before you started first grade, your dad came back from having served in the Korean War, having only been back once in three years time. He, he, he was a medic in the war and he had tra a traumatic experience that was compounded by the trauma that he experienced in World War II. And so his reentry didn't go so well. And your parents made a decision that they shared with you and your brothers that you would split up for a period of time. Your younger brother went to Eastern Colorado with your grandparents. You and your brother, Jake, went to Missouri with your dad. And your mom, who was newly pregnant, stayed in Denver to finish her internship in medical school. And what transpired in that year, you, your family had a year of separation, and what transpired in that year was such a, a powerful and moving story and really established the themes in my mind for the book, um, the, the themes of loss and of loneliness and so on and so forth. And I wondered if you could share a little bit about that time. Yes, I could. Thank you. Um, that was a very good summary of that year. Uh, well, first of all, I was young. I believed that my parents weren't getting along, but that isn't what we children were told. We children were told that um, my mother needed to be uninterrupted in her studies and that we, we would be too much trouble if we stayed in Denver, that it was better we go away so she could focus on her studies. And, you know, I don't remember a lot about that year. I kind of went into a, I think I went into kind of a fugue state, 
almost for that year. And we lived in a little tiny trailer behind uh, my aunt's house, my aunt and uncle's house. They were very good to us, but they were busy. They had their own children. They had a farm to run. My mm-hmm. uncle sold insurance. And so most of the time, my brother and I were left alone in this trailer when we weren't in school. And uh, my dad didn't often didn't come home at night, uh, at least until very late, sometimes not at all. So we were children sitting in a trailer uh, a lot of the time. And it's funny because a few years ago, Jim and I were in the Cascades hiking. And the only lodging we could find was a trailer. Mm-hmm. And I told Jim, you know, I don't really want to stay in a trailer. Mm-hmm. But it was the only lodging we could find. So we booked this trailer. And the entire time I was in that trailer, I just had a bad case of the heebie mm-hmm. Just a real mm-hmm. bad case. Mm-hmm. I think the effects of that year on me were, first of all, uh, I was terribly lonely. Mm-hmm. And I believe it wired me for anxiety. There's a lot of research that if you take children away from their mothers, even in a situation like the child's hospitalized for a while, and yep. can't see a parent, that that child is likely to be highly anxious the rest of his or her life. Mm-hmm. And I, I think that's true with me. And I write a lot about self-calming skills. I write a lot about the ways, uh, the ways to work with oneself to stay calm and relaxed. And I think it's because I teach what I need to learn that those are the skills that have made a great difference in my life. It also ironically um, made me a very strong believer in family. And I just, I love my own family, probably in a sense to a fault. I may be a little bit more needy with my children uh, than they would wish, Mm -hmm. Uh, but it it left me with this feeling of, I want to be with, a family. I want to have family dinners. I want to uh, have regular contact with family members. And after this, this year where we didn't see my mother, a couple little stories about that. One is I just barnacled myself to my mother and any way I could be with her. Uh, really, until I left home for college, mm-hmm. I was with her. For mm-hmm. example, I worked in her office after school. Mm-hmm. I'd go mm-hmm. over to her office after school and sterilize. Um, Back then you sterilized syringes, uh, you sterilized thermometers, uh, rubber gloves, you mm-hmm. wash rubber gloves. And I'd work in the back room, keeping things clean. I'd count out medicine sometimes, but I just wanted to be with her after school. And mm-hmm. I'd go with her on house calls. Um, that was back when doctors would, would drive out in the country. And sh- I had her wake me up in the night and I'd go get in the car and talk to her. She would go in the house to be with some patient, maybe for hours, if it was an old farmer dying or something. And then she'd get back in the car and wake me up and and we'd talk on the way home. So I I very much hungered after that relationship with my mother. Uh, Yeah, it also, um, not at the time, because I was just too spaced out at the time. Mm -hmm. But it later, I think, primed me to look for love because One of the things I know about myself is I am an attachment seeking organist. Mm-hmm, I mm-hmm. love people. I'm a, a great big hugger. Um, mm-hmm. I have giant circles of friends and I stay in touch with them. And as a little kid, when I was with my aunts and uncles and grandparents, I was, I was, I was working. It. I was really trying to be the most um, loving, helpful child. Mm -hmm. And it worked out really well for me. I got a lot of love back from family members because of Mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. That makes a lot of sense. So the year was traumatic. Um, It brought my brother Jake and I very close. We were two children lost in the woods. And we're very close now. We don't have to say much to understand each other deeply. Yeah, I I was struck by a comment you made later in the book about uh, when you experience loneliness, the lights go out, you know, and this this theme of light all the way through the book and how it nourished you. And it wasn't, it's not a writing motif. It's a, it's a, it's an, an actual and a metaphorical um, uh, presence in your life. Can you, can you talk a little bit about that? You called the book 
um, after light. So I'm I, that theme is fascinating, and I think follows from that experience. You know, uh, uh, my first memory is of light, and I think it's pretty rare for people to have a memory before they have speech. Yeah. But I remember I was a baby lying on my uh, Ozark grandmother's yard, mm. looking up um, at the light through a tree. And these dapple leaps were just extraordinary. The light and shadow and the twinkling and the interplay of these leaves, the mm. sun peeping through. And I remember that as a baby. I just remember watching that light. And um, almost all of my memory is encoded in light. I can tell you what the light looked like in various places. Now, it's an interesting thing. There was some bipolar in my family. My grandfather was hospitalized with mental illness. Mm -hmm. My father may have possibly been bipolar. It's hard to know because he drank and he was traumatized. Mm -hmm. back. But he was could have been possibly bipolar. Mm -hmm. At any rate, one of the things I, I've read about bipolar people is they're very sensitive to light. Now, I'm not bipolar at all, but that light sensitivity might be there with me. Oh, yeah, that's I, interesting. I don't, I, I don't like basements. I, my husband's a musician, and if he plays in a place without windows, I don't go. Yeah. I like to have light present wherever I am. And we live in a house that we bought primarily because it has windows, big windows. Mm -hmm. That natural mm -hmm. light is very beautiful. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Well, and you tell a story in the book, and I know you were thinking about reading that, about uh, this, 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 this coffin experience where uh, you were, it was, it was very cramped, like the trailer, and it also blocked the light. I wonder if you'd like to, to read that for us. Well, thank you, I would. And uh, this, this little story, don't worry, it won't take very long, maybe five to six minutes at mm -hmm. most. Please. And uh, you already know my mom was a doc. We mm -hmm. lived in uh, a little town called Beaver City, Nebraska, mm -hmm. about three hours from my grandparents who were homesteaders in eastern Colorado, little town, little railroad town, Flagler, Colorado. And this is a story of our family getting up, going out to spend the evening, uh, the weekend evening with my grandparents. It's called The Coffin and the Chenille Bedspring. Mm -hmm. Our family visited mother's parents about once a month. Their house had two small bedrooms, a combination living and dining room, a mudroom and a kitchen with a bathroom right beside it. Because Flagler was a quiet town of only a few hundred people, most of them friends of my grandparents, there were no locks on the doors. When grandfather was mucky from working in the garden or with cattle, he would leave his shoes and overalls in the mudroom walk through the kitchen, take a bath, and take a bath while conversing with my grandmother as she cooked dinner a few feet away. When we visited, my parents slept in the guest bedroom. I slept on the couch, and my brothers slept beside me on the floor. I liked the closeness to my family, and especially to my grandmother, who slept about 30 feet away. One day, my grandfather had an idea for a new sleeping arrangement. A neighbor had purchased a refrigerator and given my grandfather the large wooden box it was shipped in. He removed the long rectangular lid and cleaned up the container. He smoothed and varnished the wood and decided that with a foam pad placed at the bottom to serve as a mattress, the inside of the box would be my bed. When we arrived one summer morning, he proudly showed me his creation. My grandmother had already put bedding inside of it. It had been placed against the wall in my parents' bedroom, my least favorite room in the house. Its only window was small and faced north. The walls were dark green and heavy furniture, and the heavy furniture was the color of burnt umber crayons. As I stood staring down at this bed, my grandfather examined my face for a happy reaction. I felt a tight ball of flame forming my chest, and I had trouble breathing. I wanted to be polite and didn't want to hurt his feelings, but I knew I couldn't handle that coffin. I was terrified and I blurted out, I can't sleep in that. My grandfather left the room quickly without looking at me. I stood there struggling with two emotions at once. I knew I had been a bad girl 
and I was frightened my mother would make me sleep in that box. Sure enough, my mother came into the dark room. We sat down on the bed and she said, Mary, you need to sleep in your new bed. Your grandfather is so proud of it. I shook my head and said, I won't do it. My mother's jaw tightened and her eyes narrowed. She looked at me and said, be a good girl now. This isn't like you. I explained to her I could force myself into a small coffin-like face. I didn't know the word claustrophobia, but I told her I would die if she made me sleep in that mm -hmm. box. I didn't expect my words would move her and they didn't. She had no tolerance for what she called neurosis. Mm -hmm. She dealt with people every day who were in physical pain, dying or facing genuinely frightening situations. Mental cases were not worthy of her attention. Mm -hmm. She said, I want you to get in that bed now. Try it out and you'll see it's fine. I had no choice. We didn't disobey our parents. I thought quickly about how I could survive doing what my mother asked. Finally, I turned away from her, shut my eyes and stepped into the box. I hoped that if I didn't see where I was, I could manage. However, I knew exactly what it was. Even worse, I imagined myself underground with someone shutting the lid on me. I could almost hear the sound of dirt hitting the coffin's lid. My chest hurt and I couldn't breathe. I leapt out of that box like it was on fire. Mm. I said to my mother, I'll run away from home if you make me do this. I looked at her and she seemed as mixed up as me. She didn't want to hurt my grandfather either. She was a good girl too. But in spite of her disdain for mental cases, she believed me at last. She said, go lie on your grandparents' bed for an hour and think about your behavior. My mother had no idea how relieved I was. I didn't mind thinking about what had just happened. I wanted to understand it myself. She also didn't realize how much I liked my grandparents' bedroom. Mm. It was no bigger than the guest bedroom, but it had two windows and was filled with light from the east and south. Mm. The white chenille bedspread was luminous in the morning sunshine. I lay down and rubbed my cheeks against its nubby blessedness. I felt the warmth of the sun and breathed in the fresh air that smelled of peaches. Suddenly I felt engulfed in bliss. The light, the bedspread, the breeze gently blowing the diaphanous white curtains. It was all holy to me. My relaxed body filled with warm white light. I don't remember how long I remained in this exalted state. I remember I tried not to move because I didn't want it to disappear. At some point, my mother came in and broke the spell. She said, it's lunchtime. Jake's going to sleep in the new bed. You owe your grandfather an apology. I stood up and shook myself off. I was waking from a trance, yet remnants of bliss flittered inside me. I floated to the kitchen and told my grandfather I was sorry. He cleared his throat and looked away, but he said, it's all right. I don't want you to be unhappy. I truly was sorry. I didn't want to hurt anyone's feelings. Yet I was also proud. Usually my only thoughts were about pleasing others, doing the right thing and not upsetting people. For once I had stood up for myself. Jake passed me the coleslaw. My grandmother handed me a glass of buttermilk and slowly I returned to the world of ordinary human interaction. I looked into the faces of everyone around the table and felt grateful to be included. Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a universe in that story thank you a whole universe in that story and it's so your readers are going to be treated I, I read this book a couple of times and they're going to be treated to many beautiful moments like that one of the things that stood out to me is this movement through oh, I hate to sound clinical post something so poetic but this movement through anxiety into being grounded, you know, through this process of being in light and being soothed by the comfort of the bed and the chenille and so forth, you know, sort of being more comfortable grounded in your own voice. It's, it's, it's interesting to think of the, the, the two things being true about you, right? That the one hand you're describing yourself as anxious and the story carries that. And on the other hand, we know you as an activist and a person with a strong voice that comes through in your actions and in what you choose to write about. 
and it's sort of all you know sort of mapped out right there in that story that's really beautiful well you know i think children that are alone a lot um they they uh if they're resilient if they're mm -hmm. lucky they figure out all kinds of, of self-calming skills mm -hmm. and of course my great self-calming skill was mother nature yes. and i was always lucky i was fortunate to live uh, in little towns and have grandparents and, and aunts and uncles with farms. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to even explain that world to children mm -hmm. today because children don't run free the way we just ran free uh, and could leave the house in the morning and come back after dark. And in my family's case, nobody noticed. Mm -hmm. So we had an enormous amount of freedom to, to be outside and develop relationships with animals. Um, mm -hmm. I had a lot of animals in my childhood, yeah. even, even animals unusual uh, for most people. Like, for example, a couple doors down from our house was a man who, um, he was a good man, Alvin Rogers. He was the janitor at our school. Mm -hmm. He had a daughter uh, with Down syndrome. And that was when children like that didn't go to school. They just stayed home all day. His daughter yeah. never left the house. But our mother told us to go play with Jolene and talk to her about our days. So she had some contact with other children. Mm -hmm. So we were in Mr. Rogers' house, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Rogers' house quite a lot, seeing Jolene. Anyway, he made money on the side in the spring by going out and digging into coyote um, homes and picking up all the baby coyotes. And then he would cut off their ears and get a $2 bounty for each pair of ears. Mm -hmm. Well, we were over there one day and I heard this little yipping out on the back porch. And of course I ran out to see what it was and it was a bushel basket full of coyotes, babies. Oh my gosh, they were so cute. And they're crawling <laughs> up over each other and crawling up the walls. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Rogers was uncharacteristically grumpy about this. Mm. And I kept saying things to him like, oh, they're just adorable. And what are you gonna name these little coyotes? And, I was young enough, I didn't have any sense for what he actually had done. And finally, he told me what he was going to do. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I ran out of the house crying and went home. And my mother, my brothers were with me. And my mother told the three of us, she said, I'll give you each $2 and you can buy one coyote, Mr. Rogers. So we all went back and picked out our coyotes. And it was a momentous decision, which yeah. one? Because we understood we had the power of life or death. In our yeah. And I remember we were very solemn and it took a long time to make our yeah. decision. But we bring home our coyotes and we played with them all summer long. This was spring. <laughs> and then in the fall, uh, they were getting a little bigger. They were nipping us a little bit. It's clear they didn't want to stick around. Mm -hmm. So we took three pounds of hamburger and gave each coyote a hamburger, a pound of hamburger and left them down by the river. I don't know if they made it or not, mm -hmm. but we had a lot of animals and that was beautiful. And then the other thing that was of great solace to me was books. I, lead, I learned to read very young. I ended up reading every book in the children's section of our library and then mm -hmm. into the adult section before I, was, before I was in high school. I was in the adult section for several years, but I loved to read and I still loved to if I yeah. go anywhere, I take something along to read in the event I have five minutes when I can enjoy it. Yeah, it's interesting to hear, you know, sort of these, these themes of resilience, the, the special people in your life, the woman that taught you pottery, your grandparents, you know, these special people in your life and also nature as a character. I think about kids now having somehow often less, fewer resources, uh, creative resources to draw on. Uh, to, for, for their own resilience and skill building. I do want to ask you about, um, you know, and, and maybe this is my stage of life uh, and, and, and hopefully perhaps some others in, in the audience. Um, you write really beautifully about your parents and how complex your experience was with each of them, but differently complex with each of them. And this, this dilemma um, that that I know therapists often have um, about 
people working through their disappointments with their parents, but coming to this place of understanding their parents as people and thinking about them as whole people. Uh, you, you, you had a quote in there. My mother used to grouse at me and say, Nancy, you can't take people out of their generation. And you, you, you told this story about going to uh, Okinawa and seeing your father through the lens of his times. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about coming to terms with your parents as people in spite of some of the difficulties, especially with your dad. You know, it's interesting because both of my brothers ended up being very angry at my parents. Mm. Um, and I never experienced that anger. Um, huh. Perhaps it was totally repressed in me. Perhaps I'm just not an angry person. I've never experienced much anger in my life about mm. anything I, except, well, politics, war, things like that, but not, not in my personal life. I don't experience much anger with people in relationships. Mm. And I think perhaps it's because, at least in part, because I realized early that anger was not a winning strategy. For me. Yeah. That the way for me to have a good life was to be loving. And mm -hmm. I, I like to live in a world where I can be loving and I can be around people who love me. And so, for example, in the mornings, I set my intention every morning for the day. And a lot of times I'll give myself a little assignment to watch for something. And some days it might be look for beauty, look mm -hmm. for humor. A lot of days it's look for the evidence of love in the universe. I like to see evidence of love in the universe. Uh, but my parents were difficult parents. I, I don't wanna minimize that. My father, very traumatized man, drank a lot, uh, not around very much, fought quite a bit with my mother, abusive to my brothers. I wasn't a victim of physical abuse, but I was a witness to a great deal of physical yeah. abuse. And in some ways, given who I am, I think it was probably harder than if I'd been abused because I cared so much about my brothers and I had such a strong sense that what was happening to them was not. And I, every now and then I actually stopped it. Both my brothers remember me mm -hmm. getting between them and my dad and in mm -hmm. the but of course, most of the time I couldn't stop it. But I loved my father. Um, I loved him even when I was a little girl and mm -hmm. could see the part of him. He was such a complicated person and I've never quite figured out how to put him in a, in a, in a stable place in my life. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, he loved, he loved wildlife photography. Oh. And he took all these black and white pictures of birds and flowers when he was in the military, mm -hmm. which doesn't sound like something a person like my father would do, but he had a very strong aesthetic sense. Another thing is he would devote his days to us children when he was home in the sense of he bought a boat and we would go to a lake and he would pull that boat and water skiers all day long without complaint. He bought us a go-kart. And he always was wanting to take us children to some track where he could help us ride around a track with a go-kart. He wasn't verbally expressive. Neither one of my parents were physically expressive. Um, mm -hmm. I taught them to hug after I went oh, how about that? started getting hugged. Mm -hmm. But, um, but he, he did his best. He felt like he'd, he'd been homeless some, as a boy during the Great Depression. Mm -hmm. And we had clothes, we had toys, we had all the pets we could want. Right. He did his best, I think, given the experiences he had had. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. And my mother, in retrospect, I'm pretty sure my mother was autistic. Um, she didn't like us to touch her. She especially didn't like us to touch her hair. Her hair. She was very socially awkward with people. Mm. Uh, she was a good doctor and she was very good in that formal, well-defined relationship. Right. But many people remember my mother as cold. I, I didn't perceive her as cold at all. Mm. I perceived her as very socially awkward. Mm. She was extremely generous. For example, mm. one time I brought home the, I don't know if they still have this, but it was the summer weekly reader subscription. Mm -hmm. And you could order books to read over the summer. 
And so, of course, my mother said she'd buy any books I wanted. And then the next morning, she said, you know, I want all of the children at the school to be able to read this summer. I'm going to call the principal and say, I will pay for any books for the children whose parents don't send back money. So she could be so kind that way. My father was the same way. One time someone admired our television said he gave it to her. He wow. said, I don't know where to buy another television. Neither wow. one of them were um, inclined to hold back in their generosity to other mm. people. So very mixed people. Yeah, very that's extraordinary. You A comment that you made that, that I found very moving um, was that your mother is more present to you now uh, post her dying than she was to you when she was alive. Yeah. And I think that, that that resonates with me, this sense of when you lose your parents, somehow you can take them back in ways that you, you weren't able to uh, when they were alive. You have different kind of access to them is how, how I was thinking about it when I was reading what you were writing. Yeah, well, I think about my parents a lot, especially this time of year. I think yeah. around the holidays, it's a time for such memory. You have so many memories of people and experiences. And I also parenthetically call on my ancestors for strength when I need them. Huh. I uh, visited my great grandmother's grave in Ireland uh, mm -hmm. a couple summers ago. And she was a bond slave. She came over here to work for a farmer for seven years to pay for her passage. Wow. But uh, she married the farmer's son, so she got off pretty lucky with that. <laughs> but uh, I have a, many, many uh, relatives and most of my aunts and all my aunts and uncles and grandparents and parents are gone now that I look back on as such strong people and so eager to be of use to me and be good to mm -hmm. me. And when I'm struggling with an issue, I will call on their strength. Now, my mother sometimes comes to me when I'm sleeping. And it's, it's like she's there. In fact, a lot of times I'll have some anxiety and think, oh my goodness, how could I have ignored my mother all these years thinking she's dead when she's right here with me? Mm -hmm. And so those visits are, are, I'm so happy to see her. And then of course she's gone again. Yeah, yeah. It's your, you move into that space and then out of it and move into that space and out of it over and over and over again. Yeah, I get what you mean. I get what you mean. Okinawa was interesting, if you don't mind my saying something. Yeah. So my father was in the Philippines in Okinawa uh, yeah. as a during World War II. Mm -hmm. He saw terrible things. He experienced terrible things. Yeah. And I was invited by the army to come to Okinawa and speak to the troops about reviving Ophelia. It was mm -hmm. just at the point they were bringing women into the armed services. Mm -hmm. And they wanted some education for the, the people in the army about women. Mm -hmm. So I flew to Tokyo to Fort Zama. My dad had been stationed there too. And then Jim and I, my husband went with me. We flew on to Okinawa. And my father, of course, had been there in a snake-filled jungle with people trying to kill him mm -hmm. and bloody, sad bodies around him. Um, lonely, not sure he'd live probably not able to stay clean uh, or have enough food and water always. But I went, uh, the army always gives people a grade. They don't know how to deal with people unless they have a rank. And so for some reason, they assigned me a very high rank. Like, I don't even know the ranks, but maybe like a colonel or something like that. Mm -hmm. So I, we got to stay in the officer's uh, headquarters best room. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, we had... A, just a beautiful room. We got to eat in the officer's mess and had special meals served for us, shown around. We went to the site where people from Okinawa who were so afraid of the Americans had come to jump off a cliff. The Japanese had told the uh, native people that the Americans would torture and kill them. Mm -hmm. So when the Americans arrived, many of them jumped off mm -hmm. this particular cliff. The army took us there to see it. And then afterwards, uh, they gave us a little vacation house on the South China Sea, where yeah. we could spend and relax. And all the time while this was happening, I thought about my father. And I thought about how different our experiences were. Mm -hmm. And how 
life was just so strange. I mean, life is really strange. If you're open, open to the, the contradictions and the both and of life, the both mm -hmm. and that mm -hmm. of life, mm -hmm. it's, it's really interesting. It's yeah, cool. it, it is. You know, you, you mentioned when uh, before that you had this, this story about your dad and you in Mexico. And uh, I just love, uh, love hearing you, would love hearing you read that if you'd like. Thank you, I'd love to. Yeah, it's, it's good timing in talking about him. I like to read these stories about my family. They remind me again of my family. Mm -hmm. Now I mentioned to you that I lived in uh, Beaver City. Yeah. And while we lived there, uh, this was when I was in junior high, six, maybe sixth grade. My father lived 25 miles away at um, tuberculosis sanatorium. They still had TB sanatoriums mm -hmm. at that time. And he, he came home on the weekends usually. But uh, every year for a few years, we went to Mexico for Christmas to get my mom out of her office and away from her patients. So this is a story called Harbor Lights. It's about five, six minutes long. As Christmas approached, dad announced, your mother needs a rest. We're taking a trip to Padre Island. A few days later, we climbed into our big Oldsmobile and headed south. Dad said, it's over a thousand miles, but we'll be there tomorrow. In those days, there were no interstates. So instead we drove through one small town after another from Beaver City all the way to Port Isabel, Texas. Heavy snow was falling on the Christmas lights of the little towns in Kansas and Oklahoma. Wreaths hung from wires across main streets and brightly decorated trees sparkled in the windows of grocery and hardware stores. Nativity scenes blanketed with snow adorned the lawns in front of the churches. In Coffeeville, Kansas, dad noticed a sign in a cafe that read 20 hamburgers for a dollar. He pulled over, walked in, and soon returned with a greasy bag full of burgers. He took a couple, handed our mom a couple, and threw the rest back to us children. We devoured them like we were piranhas in the ants. Texas had no speed limits, and when I woke in the night, the speedometer was showing 110 miles per hour. Dad was smoking and listening to country music on the radio. His window was open and I could smell dust and mesquite in the air. We had left the cold far behind. I lay on the narrow shelf between the back seat and the rear window. From my berth, I could see the stars and the road receding across the vast unfenced landscape. Rocking with the motion of the car and imagining the ocean, I fell back asleep. By early afternoon the next day, we were on the Gulf Coast in a bungalow right by the ocean. This was our first beach vacation, and we children were giddy with excitement. Beside our bunk beds, we opened our small suitcases and pulled out swimsuits. At water's edge, everything felt amazing. The glow of the Texas sun in December, the warm, soft sand under our feet, and the briny smell of the air. My brothers and I ran into the water and splashed around in its salty waves. Jake and John were long-limbed, bony boys with flat top haircuts. I can still see them falling into the cresting waves simply for the joy of it. It wasn't long before we figured out how to body surf and we devoted the rest of our trip to that immense pleasure. We were exploding with energy and as wild as weasels. One glorious day folded into the next, except for the frequent trips to the cabin for potato chips and cookies, we were outdoors from sunrise until sunset. Our mother took long naps, swam laps far from shore and played with us in the waves. A hundred yards down the beach, our father fished, catching mostly sharks, but also mackerel drum and sea trout. Whatever he caught, he cleaned and fried for dinner. He served up big platters of steaming fish that, no matter how many, we famished children could always finish. A couple of afternoons, he bought pounds of fresh shrimp to boil. Our parents ate the whole shrimp, head and shell included. We children pulled off the heads, but ate everything else. 
To this day, I enjoy the crunchiness of shrimp shells, of shrimp shells and tails. One night after dinner, dad packed up to go fishing on a pier a mile away. I asked if I could come along and surprisingly, he agreed. He stopped to buy bait and beer and he bought me an orange soda. I held the cool glass bottle with such gratitude. Then on the pier, dad set up his fishing station, opened a beer and lit a cigarette. He didn't talk much, but when he hooked something, I would watch him pull it in. That night he was catching flounder. Those silvery fish trimmed with yellow and mother of pearl were the prettiest fish I'd ever seen. When my father held up his catch, it felt as if he were showing me the moon. I stood a few feet away from him, just taking in the splashing sounds of the water hitting the pilings underneath us and the shushing sounds of the waves breaking on shore. The air smelled like fish and seaweed with a hint of gasoline. The stars hung low in the motionless sky, in the moonless sky. Far beyond the shore, shrimp boats rocked with the waves, their right, white and red lights bobbing. Closer to shore, smaller boats, some with blue lights, swayed gently. Lights from the small hotels and houses flashed their reflections onto the dark waves. Watching those lights catapulted me into an epiphany. All was right with the world. There was nothing to strive for, nothing that needed to be changed. I was aware of my dad humming a Glenn Miller song as he fished, of my nubby orange striped shirt, the lights and the smells and the liquid air. I breathed it all in. I willed myself to remember everything and to cache it deep in my memory. I never wanted the slightest detail to disappear. That night I taught myself the skill of storing moments of revelation and joy. It's a useful skill in a world filled with at least as much shadow as sun. Mm. Mary, I think you should be a writer. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I didn't expect I'd ever be a writer. Yeah. When I was a little girl, I, I read all the time. I wanted to be a writer since I was about four or five. But finally, in second or third grade, I confessed to my dad I wanted to be a writer. Mm -hmm. And since he'd almost starved during the depression, he didn't think much of the idea. Right. And he said, don't be a writer, be a doctor like your mother, and you'll always be able to support yourself. And about that time at school, our teacher had us write a sonnet. And I wrote this sonnet that compared life to the seasons with childhood, spring, and winter, old age, and so on. I thought it was beautiful. I didn't realize anybody else had ever thought of it. That. Sure. So when I turned it in, I got it back with a C, a big red C, and the teacher had written trite. And oh. I thought between my dad's advice that I shouldn't be a writer and not being able to make a C on a poem I loved, mm. I should probably give up on myself as a writer. Mm. And I did not write again until um, my daughter was, was three years old. And I was driving her to a nursery school out of town. And I would go to the little college library in that town. And I start writing in my journal. Mm -hmm. And from then I started writing letters to the editor of the paper. And I got a little job on NPR reading personal essays. Mm -hmm. And I was off. I decided yeah. I'm going to write. I may not be any good at it, but I want to do it. And I'm going to write. Well, it turns out you are good at it. So thank goodness for all of us. <laughs> I am curious in terms of writing, this is such a personal book, you know, as is this conversation. And I'm wondering for people listening, uh, it's not that your other work isn't also personal, your voice comes through in all of them. But I wonder in terms of some of your other books were trying to accomplish something, uh, you know, sort of telling the story of refugees or, you know, sort of, uh, bringing women along at a certain stage of their life, which thank you for doing that. Um, and, and talking about teen girls and how they organize themselves around the male gaze, all these wise concepts. But this book is very personal and tells about your life and your stories and what you love and what reached you and what challenged you. There's a lot of pain and a lot of loss in this book. 
And I wonder from a writing perspective, how different that was for you and, and what you're anticipating from your audience being someone who wrote from, from sort of an activist place. Yeah, well, uh, the books, the writing I do about myself is the easiest. It just falls on the page um, because I, I just tell the truth. And of course I, I work on it to make the language a little better and, and to eliminate things that don't need said. But the gist of it comes very easy. I could write one of the chapters in this book sometimes in a morning and have it more or less finished, even though it took me 18 months altogether to write it. But I had a very good friend, an author named Kent Harris, H-A-R-U-F, yeah. wonderful yeah. writer. Well, he was in my writing group and he actually oh, was responsible for helping me uh, find an agent. He sent my, my early work to his agent who gave me a reference to my agent. But anyway, Kent, when he was dying, wrote a book called Benediction. Mm -hmm. And when I read this book, I thought, you know, he's trying to tell the reader everything he knows about what's important in life. And one of the thoughts I had when I wrote A Life in Life was, we all have these lives of sun and shadow. We all have, at the very least, as much pain as we have pleasure. Mm -hmm. And I, I wanted to have this book sort of be my benediction, where I said to readers, this is this is this is how you can deal with pain. These are these are some of the things I learned about resilience, and these are some of the things that helped me when I, when I was feeling my lowest. So it is, in a sense, like all my books. I, I try to write cultural therapy. Yeah, I, when I was a therapist. I, I I really enjoyed helping one person at a time. Mm -hmm. But when I started to write books like Hunger Pains on Eating Disorders, I, I wanted to I wanted to help more people than one person. Mm -hmm. And in this book, I, I deeply enjoyed writing. It it writing is telling oneself a story, right? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And over time, um, the stories become purer and more true. Mm -hmm. And um, they help me. Um, sort of smooth out the roughest edges of my life. Mm -hmm. But I also had the reader in mind because I, I really believe, Nancy, that everyone could write a book like this mm -hmm. and could call it a life in life mm -hmm. and go mm -hmm. back and look through these, these tough moments in their life mm -hmm. and realize, well, here's how I pulled myself out. You know? yeah. When I was a therapist, I did a lot of trauma work. Yeah. And I would ask people, when they would, of course, like all therapists, I would listen to the story. I would try to understand the impact of the story on them and their lives. Um, I would try to be empathic and, and so on. But a lot of times, one of my first questions would be, when you look back at this situation where you had so little control, what is it you feel good about? What is it in that situation where you had maybe just a sliver of control Mm -hmm. that you feel proud of. Mm -hmm. And it was very interesting. Nobody ever said they had no control. Mm -hmm. People could always find something to feel proud of. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's sort of like this book, you know, there's always, there's always a way to take a situation that feels unworkable and make it work. I believe that. If I didn't yeah. believe that, I, I don't know how I could go on because yeah. certainly as I age, there'll be many situations that feel unworkable. Sure. Future. Sure. So, yeah, it occurred to me one of the things that you you wrote about when you were writing about therapy was that you were always helping clients to find a transcendent narrative, yes. and I felt like that's what this book was doing for you. You know, was was it was a transcendent narrative for you to write this book, and it was it was beautiful and offered all of us, you know, extraordinary wisdom. I really encourage people to read this because you wrote really beautifully about your process in the pandemic. So if we could take just a minute on that, because holy cow, talk about a cultural moment that oh, challenged yeah. people and dropped people into a, a struggle with themselves and who they were and what things meant and what was true. And, you know, you wrote about that taking you right up to the edge and then uh, coming to this, this sense of acceptance. 
Can you talk just a little bit about that? Well, I suspect my experiences with the pandemic were very much like uh, all of the viewers' experiences were. Mm -hmm. uh, we were far from family. Uh, we didn't see people. We were uh, staying home almost all the time. Fortunately, I live on a city park with a, with a, a lake. So I could go out and walk just two and a half miles around the lake. And one thing I actually liked about the pandemic was the whole town turned into walkers. So right. we had almost the Easter parade every day walking. Right. Like, that was nice. And we could wave to people and see people. Right. But I'm very much someone who um, likes to see people, likes to touch people, likes to be in a room full of friends. Uh, really likes to be with my grandchildren and they were young and at home. And I, I went, my Canadian grandchildren, the border was closed. So I didn't see them for a long mm -hmm. time. And uh, a couple things happened during that time. One is we had holidays alone, Jim and I, and we didn't quite know what to do. Uh, so we figured out where's our favorite place nearby. And it's this beautiful prairie called Spring Creek Prairie that has buffalo wallows. It has Oregon trail ruts. It has an old growth bur oak forest. Uh, it has some rocks that came down in front of the glacier that was over the Great Plains. Beautiful. We just decide on holidays when we're alone, we'll go walk on that prairie. And the first time we did that, we, we went out there, it was, a, warmer Thanksgiving day. And eventually we ended up just lying down in the grass on our coats and looking at the sky and watching the, the tall blue stem grass blow over our heads in the wind. And it made it a good day. We, we figured out how do we make it a good day and we, we made it a good day. The another thing that happened during that was um, we had a, a Christmas, we weren't gonna see anybody but people still decorate. And so one night when I was feeling very low, Jim said, well, let's just drive around and look at Christmas lights. Mm -hmm. And those Christmas lights just march right out of people's trees and off their, off their trees and out of their yards, right into my heart. Mm -hmm. And the, the lights just cheered me up enormously. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we were very glad when it was over. Um, one thing that happened to, to Jim and, and me, and I think it probably happened to a lot of people, is we got much closer. He's yeah. a musician. He pays about 100 gigs a year. Mm -hmm. I have a life that's different than his in terms mm -hmm. of my activism and activities. Mm -hmm. So we can sometimes go several, several six, seven days in a row without having an evening together at home. Sure. And we were two cards holding each other. Mm -hmm. We both had the sense this is the person I'm going to be with for a very long time. And if that person isn't happy, I'm not going to be happy. Mm -hmm. So we ended up just, um, we played a lot of Scrabble, listened to music, danced. Uh, mm -hmm. We had these conversations. If you live with someone a long time and you don't do much during the day, but sit around your house, it's a challenge to have an interesting conversation. It is. So we, we created all these conversations like, well, let's go back over our entire lives and try to remember the 10 best sunsets we've ever seen. Or let's remember all the restaurants we've eaten in and try to pick the top. Three. So we would just have these ways to review our lives that, that, that comforted us because it reminded us of how lucky we were and how much fun we'd had over the years. You know, a couple of things. One is if uh, there, there's, there's so much wisdom in that in terms of taking action and being deliberate and being intentional. And you wrote this beautiful New York Times piece uh, essay, How to Build a Good Day When I'm Full of Despair at the World. So I, I'm, I'm sending you all off to read that because it's a, this, this book and, and that essay will help you get through a lot. It also occurs to me, Mary, that um, you and your mother have something in common which is that when you when you tell a story, there's a moral to it. You, yes. you, you, you talked about your mother in the books that she would tell lots of stories and there was always a moral to it. And I found this a deeply moral book and that sense of, you know, with, with wisdom and some serious psychological savvy, um, you know, inspiring people to, 
to uh, take a shot at doing things differently. So it, you're, you're such a gift. You're really such a gift. Thank, Thank you. you. It's really been a pleasure to have you interview me. You're a gift yourself. So. Thank you so much. Thank you. Lonnie, can I have a couple more hours? <laughs> well, you get at least one more at after hours. So yeah, you do get a little bit more. Um, wow, what a what a beautiful, thoughtful, lovely winter, beginning of winter solstice almost coming up on us. Um, solstice, yes. Um, thank you so much for being so prepared, uh, Nancy. Such you're always such a generous interviewer. Um, really, really appreciate it, Mary. Uh, what a delight hearing you read two stories for everyone. People are commenting um, that they're so touched by just being in your presence and hearing your words to know, you know, I'm not surprised for that. I want to mm -hmm. remind folks that we're going to be hosting an after hours with both Mary and Nancy. Uh, that's going to be beginning at 805 Central. That's in about eight minutes from now. I'm going to post in chat. If you don't have chat open, uh, open it now. I'm going to post a link in there um, that will allow you to purchase a copy of a Life in Light in paperback out today from our bookseller, partner bookseller, the bookstall. Uh, in your receipt that you get from them via email is the link to register for After Hours. Come hang out with us. We're going to continue this conversation. You can ask your own questions. You can um, tell Mary how much you love her work, which I'm sure is, uh, you can't hear that enough, I'm sure. I'm going to ask a question that was shared um, today uh, during the event. Um, Jan had asked, um, how did you heal from your past where some struggle and often do not heal from past childhood trauma? So kind of, they want to know what was your secret sauce, Mary? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, that question has interested me my whole life. Um, why is it some people can be knocked over by a feather mm -hmm. and there's other people that Sherman Pat can't go down? I don't know the answer to that. That's an answer for uh, countless hours of discussion. I think one thing that, for example, my brothers had much more trouble uh, both growing up and in their later lives than I had. And I, I think one of the things that was helpful to me was after the war, my folks went to Missouri to, and they were, uh, my dad ran a little general store and my mom lived in a little house out in the country that my dad had built with me. And so I got a year of attachment with my mom mm -hmm. and she didn't have anything else to do but hold me and, and walk me around the place. And I had, my Ozark family is extremely warm and loving. And I had my grandma and a couple of aunts down there. And I think that year um, primed me to be an attaching person. And I also think that um, I just, I got some of the strength from my ancestors. I, I, I really believe that. You know, that I, I got some of the strength from my ancestors. Thank you. I appreciate that. Well, we're here at 7.59. We're almost done. Nancy, do you want to take us out? Any final thoughts in the last minute that we have here? I'd like to spend an hour on why some people are resilient and others aren't. But I would I would punctuate a few things in your story, Mary, if I could, which is you had these figures, these adult figures all the way across your life that were taking you in as a whole person, not as a little doll and not as an ornament, but as a whole person and really listening to you. And there's something about being heard across the lifespan that probably adds to whatever temperamentally is there. That, 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 that's, that's a thought I have from reading your story. That's a very good thought. And one of the things I say in the book is my mother's mother my grandmother loved me into existence. Yeah, she when I was very young, she started to really attend me and give me the feeling that I was important. Thank you, Nancy. On that note, thank you everyone for joining us tonight for our last event of 2023. We hope to see you in just a few minutes at After Hours. We'll open that room at about 8.05 as soon as Mary and Nancy. We're going to give them a little short break. And uh, thanks for joining us all fall. We have a lot of great winter programming coming up. So hope to see you all again very soon. Thank you so much and good night. Thanks, Lonnie. Thanks, Pam. Thank you.